Welcome to Take Notice, Amplifying Black Stories. I'm your host, Allison Preisinger Higgins. Take Notice, Amplifying Black Stories is a podcast exploring society, culture, and current events through conversation. We aspire to create an open, respectful, and equitable space where guests may feel free to share their truth and lived experiences. Our core values are rooted in community, connection, and personal development. Stories help us learn, relate, and grow. We are here to listen, to take notice. Thank you for being with us. I would like to acknowledge the land on which this episode was created. I would like to show gratitude to the traditional ancestral land of the Coast Salish people, including the Duwamish people past and present. Land acknowledgement statements are an important part of honoring those whose land we now live and work on. We begin each episode this way to help spark ideas and keep these conversations in the front of our minds so that we may continue to be open to doing better. I encourage listeners to research the land on which you live and are listening right now. Recognizing this is just the beginning. Some additional next steps to consider would be to seek out the stories of Native people from our shared history and today. Spend time asking yourself difficult questions and challenging norms that may be linked to colonialism. Engage in your community around topics like land tax, curriculum, hiring practices, decision-making, organizing, and reparations. Seek out media created by Native people. The more you explore, challenge, and learn, the more questions may arise. But this is how we grow and connect. Thank you for joining us for Take Notice, Amplifying Black Stories. There's just a couple of weeks left for season two of Take Notice, and we've been releasing one episode a week to close out the season. So I hope you've been enjoying the extra episodes. If you would like to give us your feedback, we would love to hear it. Our surveys for listeners are available on our website. If you go to takenoticepodcast.org, you can find a survey. I would love to hear what you thought of season two as we move forward towards season three, which will be starting in September. Speaking of season three, if you are interested in being a guest in season three, also visit our website, takenoticepodcast.org. Or send us an email, takenoticepodcast at gmail.com, and we can get you going with getting set up with an interview. I had such an interesting conversation with my guest for this episode, Mark Casey. He shares stories of his journey through many career transitions to get where he is today as a film writer, director, and producer. From the police department straight out of high school in Detroit, to landing his first acting gig on The Young and the Restless, to producing work that inspires, educates, and encourages critical thinking. You'll hear about his recent releases like Flint Tail and Black Skin, as well as some upcoming projects. A portion of our conversation I saved to share at a later time because we went a little longer than we normally do for Take Notice. So I saved this portion of our conversation for a later time because I think it'll be a good conversation starter. It'll be a good something to consider. So that'll be a bonus episode that you will hear before the end of season two. And I look forward to sharing it with you. Mark Casey is an American film writer, director, and producer. His first film, Nikita Blues, was selected for the HBO short film competition at the Acapulco Black Film Festival in Acapulco, Mexico. Thank you for supporting our Take Notice guests, and thank you for being with us. Please enjoy this episode with Mark Casey. So thanks for joining me on Take Notice. I appreciate being able to connect with you this morning. Where are you located? Are you uh, on the West Coast as well? Los Angeles. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I'm just north of you in uh, much colder weather in Seattle. (laughs) We're in the 30s this week. Uh, We had snow yesterday, and I imagine that you all are not anywhere near that. (laughs) No, but guess what, though? This is why this place is the land of milk and honey. Mm. Because right now in San Bernardino County, it's snowing everywhere. So I can actually go uh, skiing this weekend, I mean, uh, today, come back and go surfing at Santa Monica Beach. (laughs) Now tell me, this is why California real estate is so expensive because this is the land of milk and honey. This this is a (laughs) wonderful place. It's just the cost of living, $2,000 for a single apartment. One bedroom, $3,000. Okay, two bedroom, $3,500. Man. Maybe $4,000. I thought Seattle was bad too. Man, that's that's, uh, not great. Yeah, I heard you guys I ran up there too. I oh, it's getting nutty. Yeah, just in the last ten years, I, I 
uh, grew up north of here and then moved away. Came back about, I don't know, close to 10 years ago and was able to get a studio or a small place for less than a thousand. And I'm sure the, the same spot now is probably... I don't know, 15, eight, you know, f- around more like 15, but it, not as bad as LA or New York, I don't think, but it's, it's creeping up just cause uh, lack of housing for sure. So people are definitely getting pushed out of the, the city. We don't, we don't have lack of housing. We just have greedy. Uh, land we have plenty of housing, but they yeah. know they can get it because like I said, this is the land of milk and honey. Yeah. Yeah. I, I suppose it, it could be, it's definitely probably a mix of that here too. Actually, yeah, now that you put it that way, lack of housing is probably an excuse. <laughs> so, <laughs> how long have you been doing uh, movies? Yes, I went to USC film school um, because of Spike Lee made this little movie called She Gotta Have It, and I thought it was horrible. And I said, if he can do this, I can do this. And then uh, I saw how expensive it was to make a movie, and I said, I guess I can't do this because his grandmother helped him finance his, and my grandmother didn't have that. Mm credit score that his did. So uh, then another kid came out named uh, John Singleton. And I said, whoa, he didn't use his grandmother's money. He used the studio's money. And how did he do it? So I looked at his blueprint, which was he went to USC film school. So my grades wasn't up. So I went to a junior college and got a 3.6. And uh, in one year, got a 3.6 and transferred. And then the rest of my years at USC, um, got into USC and try to follow John Singleton's footsteps and get me a studio deal going. So it didn't happen the way I hoped it happened. But, you know, I, I, I've had some successful uh, feats that I'm proud of. And, uh, but I didn't get the, the gold ring yet that John and um, mm. Mr. Lee has. Sure. Yeah. I'm, but I'm not complaining because I don't I don't measure my success with theirs because I, I have my own success. Mm-hmm. I'm proud of. Yeah, yeah, we each kind of have our own path, but yeah. So then you are, did you grow up in the Southern California area as well then? No, I came from a, a little small country town. You probably never heard of it. It's called Detroit, Michigan. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> All right, so you, you grew up in Detroit, <laughs> no, anyway, right? <laughs> yeah, so mm-hmm. I didn't like the cold weather. I mean, I hated the cold weather to the point that I was willing to move anywhere warm, whether it was Hawaii, Florida, mm. Arizona, whatever. But I had this Hollywood vision in my mind, and I wanted to get to L.A. I wanted to see what's L.A. as beautiful as I saw on Eddie Murphy's uh, Beverly Hills Cop. Mm. So I assumed that it looked like that. Then I saw, you know, Clueless and all these other movies. I'm like, whoa. I need to be in California. There's palm trees. And, and so uh, I packed my little Pontiac Fiero and drove cross country and uh, got to Hollywood, literally to Hollywood Boulevard and said, this is a dump. Because during that time, uh, there was homeless people everywhere, which it still is, but not as bad. Mm-hmm. There was homeless people everywhere. And I was like, this cannot be Hollywood. You know? mm-hmm. But I didn't understand about you know set dressing and, and the way Hollywood operated. But uh, it was a little bit of setback for me. But I hung in there and, and, and I realized that this is the, the land of milk and honey once again and the land of opportunities if you're in the entertainment business. Mm-hmm. This is the place to be. Yeah. yeah, a little bit of a, a reality dose when you first got here. When mm-hmm. when was that? Was that straight out of high school, straight after, after that? Oh, yeah, junior right, right out of high school. Okay, okay. nice. Right out of high school, yeah. Was there a moment that made you decide to to do film and and come or a mo- or a particular movie or is it just kind of a gradual interest? No, it it was the the, the movie was uh, Beverly Hills Cop with Eddie Murphy. Okay, um, but I was in law enforcement. I was on the Detroit Police Department at the time, ah. and I got uh, in some trouble. And and my ex wife at the time, uh, she got her arm broken, and I was trying to defend her with some other officers. Uh, because during that time, um, Detroit had uh, a, a lot of uh, Caucasian uh, white officers. And me being black and young, I was very young. And back then, they hired, believe it or not, which is ludicrous when I look back at it, they were hired uh, teenagers to be uh, police officers uh, at the age of 18. Uh, with no education, just a high school diploma, you were allowed to be a police officer, which I thought was, not. I look back, it doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. So we're talking about an 18-year-old kid with a gun on his hip and and a badger in his uh, chest, 
And when law enforcement didn't work out there, I got a little bit extremely depressed because all my friends was on the force and I found myself working security. And when a police car drove past and I'm in a uniform and said security, it was quite embarrassing. So mm-hmm. I said, it's time for me to get out of town because I don't have uh, the silver shield anymore, not, not the real one. And um, my desire was always entertainment or someone famous. So I, I, even as a Detroit police officer, I would have been that top cop that everybody would have heard about because that's just how egotistic I was about being somebody important. And so I would have taken that job and made it a celebrity job anyway. I would have been the chief of police or something uh, because that's just the way I am. That's just the DNA that I had in me and have in me. So I packed up, um, once I started working these nickel and dime security jobs, and it was like, well, you can come back in a couple of years. I'm like, I'm not standing around as no security guard, and and, and, and I'm going to take a chance to go to Hollywood. So I literally got some big old uh, 11 by 14 headshots made. I didn't know headshots was black and white back then. They were 8 by 10s. And I literally had portraits of me <laughs> looking like yeah. a fool. Uh, 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 when I got to LA and I met with all these agents and they laughing at these big old pictures of mine in color. Oh. Uh, uh, now, now uh, in Hollywood, the pictures are in color, but back mm-hmm. then, if you had any pictures that were in color, they knew that you weren't from there and that you uh. were not someone that they was willing to hire because you didn't do your research. Oh, okay. So I literally went around circles trying to figure out, okay, let me get some headshots made. And uh, I did. Uh, I found some guy on, um, it was like a Craigslist they used to have, but it wasn't Craigslist. It was on, on paper, uh, a Craigslist mm-hmm. on paper, if you will. And I met a guy at the Hollywood Bowl, and he took some pictures of me for like 20 bucks and uh, with natural lighting from the uh, Hollywood Bowl area. And those pictures got me more work than any anything. And, and the, the other photographers wanted $200 and all this. And this kid had a little camera, and, and I pretty much got – in the door because of that that one picture that had me smiling. And my first gig was on a Young and a Restless. And then I got uh, as an extra. Then I got on the Bold and the Beautiful as an extra with that same picture that I sent mm. out to the casting director. So I'm on the Bold and the Beautiful on CBS at Television City off of uh, Fairfax. And I believe it's Mill Rose or Beverly Boulevard. Yeah, Beverly, Beverly Boulevard. And this is where they shoot the prices right to this day. And and all the other um, game shows are shot there. And also the other soap operas are shot there. Mm-hmm. And so I'm in heaven in my mind because I'm, I'm at a place in Television City, CBS, that my mama used to watch these soap operas. And I'm literally communicating with these actors and and uh, calling my mom. Said, Mom, you don't know who I just met? It was a wonderful experience. And they had a guest director come in from New York. That's what they used to do all the time, have guest directors. And this director came in and he saw me doing the extra work. I was a bartender or a waiter. waiter. And he says, hey, why is this guy doesn't have any lines? The black kid, why he doesn't have any lines? He said, because he's just a background extra. And the guy said, no, he's not. Give him some lines. And they came over to me and said, hey, we got to take you up to the contract room. I say, for what? Oh, you about to get some lines and we got to give you a whole new contract. Now. What? And so it was one of those Hollywood stories you hear. Mm-hmm. I, I, I was part of it. So I literally went upstairs to the business affairs. They, they sat down and typed this long <laughs> contract, put me in hair and makeup because extras don't get hair and makeup unless you're in a really specialized scene. So mm-hmm. now I'm in hair and makeup with the celebrities, <laughs> getting makeup, getting hair to, and they, that's how I got in Screen Actors Guild, which is called SAG. If you guys don't know, that's listening. Uh, I was Taff Hartley and blessed to get in through being an extra or atmosphere on a, mo- uh, on a TV show called Bold and the Beautiful. And guess what? Miracles happen like that because you're in the right place at the right time. Mm. And a lot of times people don't understand that. Now, I was only making $90 or whatever it was as an extra. And, and my obviously my fee quadrupled because I I was a, a, a now a, a union player. So I'm saying a lot of people would would not even take that job that I did because they thought I was beneath them. But right. I said, no, I need to learn the business from scratch. So I'm gonna take you know extra jobs, atmosphere, background. I'm going to go, and I was literally missing. I wouldn't even take a regular job because that's how bad I wanted to learn this industry. Even my agent, I had an agent at that time, and she kept saying, I don't want you doing no background work. I don't want you doing no extra work. Mm. And I was like, yeah, okay, no problem. But she didn't know that I was hungry to learn the industry. And the only way you're going to learn the industry, if you go to the car plant 
and learn how to build the cars, not go to the car lot when it's already done. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to know how it, it is to make a TV show, how it is to make a movie by any means necessary. And if that was getting in on on the ground level as a background or atmosphere, I was going to do that. And that's what I did. And that gave me a lot of uh, education on on how Hollywood operate and got me in the door as a Screen Actors Guild. Wow. So yeah. that was my journey to Hollywood initially before I became this big time famous Hollywood director. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. How, are you still connected with that director that uh, singled you out and gave you that, that bump up or... No, it's funny you said it. I would like to find him, but he was really old then. And he was a, a really old white guy. And he had to be about 75. Eight. And so he would, no, he wouldn't be alive now. But mm-hmm. he was a famous, like, stage director. And they wanted him to direct this TV. So they flew him in. So he was literally from New York. And he, I guess he saw something in me that, that they, they didn't and demanded them give me lines. Wow. But, I, but when I saw him, we talked and everything. I thanked him. And, and uh, you know, he knew I was real. He knew what he was doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, did you? Were you into theater and and the arts and things when you were in in high school or or elementary or anything? I wasn't. I wasn't into acting, but I was in. The, I played saxophone. I was into music. And, and oh, see, nice. originally, I figured if I don't make it as as an actor, I will be uh, the next Kenny G before Kenny G came out. And then when Kenny G came out, I said, oh, man, I can't touch this guy. He's phenomenal. <laughs> so he kind of spoiled it for me. So mm-hmm. I didn't become the next Kenny G. So I, I said, well, let me try this acting thing. And, you know, it always have other plans if things don't work out. And mm-hmm. acting at the time, during that time, you only had uh, a few black shows. One of them, and I wouldn't even say black show because this show wasn't really black. It was called uh, 21 Jump Street. It just happened to have mm-hmm. a couple of black characters. But all the shows, it was no other shows on that were uh, except the Cosby show, obviously. And that was shot in New York. See, if I'd have been in New York, mm-hmm. I'd have been on the Cosby show for sure. For sure. And I almost went to New York a couple of times. But I, uh, once again, that cold weather, I wasn't going to do right. cold weather. So uh, we didn't have that. We didn't have uh, the Cosby show. So we had no black shows in L.A. except, uh, like I said, 21 Jump Street, which had uh, Holly Robinson Pete in it and a couple gang bangers that were black. And I auditioned for those roles as well. And it, it got demeaning because I had to come in with a stocking cap on and fake gun on. And, mm. and one time I went to a hunter. I don't know. It was a show called Hunter. And I went to uh, Stephen J. Connell's office for casting right off of Sunset in Highland. And I walk in a room and all these beautiful people are there, all, all American white folk with blonde hair, blue eyes. And here I come in there with a skull cap, I mean, with a stocking cap on, a fake gun, and some jeans on, and everybody froze. Mm. <laughs> and I'm like, calm down, I'm here for an audition. Oh, no. <laughs> you know, oh. so at that point there, I, I, I kind of said, you know what, I don't want to do this. I don't want to take roles. And, and and even my headshot started being pictures of me as a thug. Because mm. I fell into that, that uh, stereotype of being a thug that they wanted me to be. And I got discouraged. So the Cosby show uh, wanted to expand and Bill Cosby came up with a show called A Different World with all black folk and Mm -hmm. one white girl, uh, Marissa Tomei, I think it was. Uh, She was the only Caucasian on the show. Everybody else was black. So they had this big old audition. I'm literally working as another extra on a movie, learning, like I said. And um, they had this big casting call. So uh, at the time... The woman when I was with was like, Mark, they're having auditions for the new Cosby show called A Different World. And so I asked the AD, a production person, can I leave? He was like, no, you leave. I'm firing you. And I really needed the money to pay my rent. So <laughs> I have some story. So my, my woman at the time felt like she fell on the set. And I said, I got to take her to the uh, emergency uh, <laughs> urgent care. And obviously the assistant director is not going to stop me because he don't want to assume them. So he said, no problem, Mark. Just go ahead and take it. Y'all get, y'all get paid for the whole day. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so we went to the urgent care to get the paperwork so we don't, you know. Oh, yeah. Right. Lose our, you know, stance with the, with these companies and went straight to, to the studio. Uh, I think it was Sunset Gower Studios was having this uh, audition for the Cosmic, the new spinoff. And um, the line was wrapped around the building, mm. literally. And then they they was they said whoever is not in the first fifteen in the line, all the ones that a mile around the building, you can go home because we we don't need you now. I said what? 
And I said to the lady I was with, I said, uh, hey, listen, I came a long way to make it. And I've been trying to get on the Cosby show, but I couldn't go to New York. Now the Cosby show is here with a new show. I'm not going nowhere. And she said, well, the guy said, no, Mark, so I'm leaving. So she left. I jumped the fence. <laughs> <laughs> I jumped the fence. I literally jumped over the wall of Sunset Gower Studios, Bob wires and all. <laughs> Got in, ran into the bathroom and act like I was using the bathroom. So when I came out, it looked like I was coming out of a bathroom, not off of some wall. And I made it to the audition. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, the, the question is, how bad do you want it and, and what sacrifice are you willing to make? And at the time, the lady that was running it was a big time cast. And she did all the old shows, the Jeffersons and the Good Times, all the old shows from the 80s and the early 70s, I mean, late 70s. Her name was Eileen Knight. And so I, I finessed my way in front of her and she said, come on in. And I, I'd get a little quick audition. She says, have you been to... I can't think of the gentleman name, but he was from the Love Boat. I'm, I know I'm dating myself with these old TV shows. He has an acting class. I said, no, I haven't. Well, come back to me when you get when you uh, go to his acting class. Because he was like the gateway to Hollywood. You had mm -hmm. to take his acting class, and he probably kicked them down some money. That's how they do anyway. And I said, what the heck? Well, no, but can, you, can I do something on the show? <sighs> like I said, I don't give up. She said, just go talk to the, the stage manager or somebody, you know. And then when you get that class, then we, you come back and audition for a role. So I, I meet the stage director. The guy named was Chuck Vincent, and he wound up being a big time director. He said, yeah, I can use you. He made me an extra. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> but they, this extra was made a lot more money because you had to be in a union for NBC. Mm -hmm. So I wound up being on a different world as the background atmosphere with Lisa Bonet and all these other stars, with them, Marissa Tomei. And I got to meet all of them because we all hung out together, laughed, ate, and everything else. But it was just eating me up inside because I knew I can play a character, not some guy in the back mining. And I ran up and stopped going because uh, it was starting to affect my spirit. But I did become friends with the writer. So this is going to segue to present day. And the writer at the time name was Thad Mumford. And I said, uh, is it possible? How do you get a script? written and become on TV. He said, well, you have to go through, they have writer's programs and uh, da, 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 you know, and I'm like, writer's program? Well, I haven't even been to college. Well, or you can do a spec script. I said, what is that? And, uh, we didn't have Google, so he explained to me the spec script. So I went and took one of the different world scripts, wrote my concept based upon the format on a little Casio typewriter, i never forget, and I came up with the story line and I typed it exactly like I saw it in that script. So I learned the, the, the proper format, submitted it to him. He took it. Oh, this is good. But guess what, Mark? You need to go to college and learn how to write properly. Hmm. Okay. So he didn't want to put the seed in my, in my, to go to film school and learn right. But they actually took that episode and made, they rewrote it. They took the uh -huh. concept and, and, and made a TV show based upon my spec script. Oh, really? Uh, my idea was that good that they took it and wrote it in a proper format, which I thought it was a proper format, but obviously it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And they took that idea. Obviously, I didn't say they stole anything because I was, I was, it's not in my nature. Because Dad Mumford said, I'll do you a favor. I'm going to get you a meeting with the casting people to get you on the show since I see how hungry you are. And so at that time, the lady originally that was casting was gone. So now it's two new casting people. And Karshi Warner was the one producing the show with Bill Cosby, and uh, they had the Roseanne Barr show as well. So I went in there, auditioned. They didn't give me a part. I said, you know what? I'm not doing this anymore. And I said, you know what? Let me figure out how to write to make my own part. Mm -hmm. So I started writing, and I went to school to learn how to write properly, and I wrote movies that I can play in myself. And Somewhat like uh, Sylvester Stallone did. He was like my hero because he wrote Rocky and they said, no, 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 no. We we, we getting, uh, not Rock Hudson. It was another guy, uh, fan, Paul Newman. One of those two uh, uh, was hired to play that role. And he, and he said, well, then you can't make this movie because I want to be Rocky, Balboa. And he did. So he, st he stood his ground. Mm -hmm. And so I took that concept and started writing. I started falling in love with writing more than I did acting. So once I got in, into uh, film school, I literally started, doors started opening up for me, uh, HBO and everything. So I, I started um, my first feature film at the time is called Nikita Blues. 
I shot it as a short film first. And um, I was nominated to um, go to uh, Acapulco Black Film Festival at the time. And HBO took the project and actually showed it on HBO. And then HBO called me and said, can you make this out of a feature film? Which I did. And the executive that was looking at me at the time, he uh, got fired. So my project went went nowhere. And uh, But I did get to... Uh, they made me make it out of a feature film version, which I never would have done if they wouldn't have given me that seed to say, hey, we like this short. Can you make this out of a feature? And I did. So I, I wrote it, submitted it. He was replaced and the new person wasn't interested. And so I said, you know what? I'm going to do this myself. So I went to Kodak and begged them for free film. Um, went to uh, Panavision and told them, uh, hey, I'm a student. Can I get your student package? And I, I shot the movie myself with some investment money from a pastor and, and some investment money from one of the stars I hired. I hired Essence Atkins and uh, Roz Ryan. If you Google them, you'll see they're very much celebrities. They're working right now as we speak mm-hmm. on major shows. And um, we did the, my first feature film called Nikita Blues, which made a, quite a, few, made a lot of money. Mm. But unfortunately, I didn't get it because I signed over the right. This is another learning curve as a filmmaker. I yeah. signed over my rights, uh, my licensing rights to a company called Big Bear uh, Licensing. And he sold it all over the world and it, it made $1.2 million and I got five grand. Hmm. So I literally had to sue and get the movie back in my possession, which I do have now. So you can see Nikita Blues on Amazon and it's going to be on Tubi for free in the next couple of days. It oh, should be good. up on Tubi. So you'll be able to see my first feature film, The Key to Blues. Wow. And I've talked so much, so you must have some questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. It's an interesting um, journey to getting to your path, because I imagine going through all those different things helps inform what, how and what you direct now, too. So if we were to go back a bit for a second, when you were growing up, who were you surrounded by? I know you mentioned your mom and... Did you have siblings growing up as well? And then a follow up question to that was how how do they how have the people that you grew up with feel about your your journey now, or are you connected with them now? Yeah, I grew up with a mother and a father. Thank God, uh, they weren't in the same home, but they mm-hmm. uh, they were both in my life, and uh, they were divorced. But I had a mother and a father uh, in my life, and my brothers and sisters had all. We all had different. No one had the same mother and father. We all had different. Uh, uh, father, so that was quite interesting. We all had some kind of talents, and my brother was an artist and singer. And at the time, like I said, I was a musician. I played saxophone. Yeah. So um, we we kind of had a little bit of entertainment in our, our family, in a sense. I was just the one that went hard at it to get it. You know, um, mm-hmm. they were they were they weren't that aggressive with it. It's like, okay, it didn't happen. I'm gonna go work at the plant or do something else. So, right. so pretty much that's that's what happened uh, as growing up. I had the um, t- typical young black kid um, growing up exposure. Um, we weren't we weren't in the ghetto. We were in in, in this area. Um, I was in a, a housing projects, but if you threw a rock, you'd be in this exclusive white neighborhood called Rosedale Park. So I was able to leave my uh, small enclave of a ghetto, if you will, and go into a world of people with money and success. And it was like. So I would go rake their grass, I mean, uh, uh, rake their leaves and cut their grass and sing carols to them. And, and, I, and I was like, wow, this is beautiful, big old brick, beautiful home. And I actually own one of those homes now that I have my family living in because it was, it was really nostalgic for me. Even when I go home now mm-hmm. and I look at this home, the neighborhood was, at the time was all white. Now it's maybe 10 percent white. Uh, and ninety percent black. <laughs> oh, okay. But back then it was the uh ten uh, percent black and ninety percent white. It just it just it reversed and it And you called, own one of those places in Detroit? Oh in Detroit. Big old big old brick home and wow. uh, yeah. uh the white folks used to own. <laughs> yeah, own, yeah. I own one and it was important for me to have one just just because when I was a kid it, I didn't think that I would ever be able to own mm-hmm. a house like that. But I, I was blessed enough to buy one outright so yeah but it's not doing me any good because i'm in los angeles right. <laughs> do you have family living there or uh yeah i have family in the home in detroit that's nice that's nice to be able to do that too 
Do you think, so you were talking about in your journey, you were working hard to like, you jumped over fences and you didn't let things go and you made up, you know, all these scenarios to where you could get the thing that you want to get. What do you think, what kind of informed that? Do you think, are you able to look back and say, I, I probably was doing that because of this, or I wanted this so bad because of this. Is there anything that pops into mind? Success. I wanted success. And I, 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 and I wish I wish I could have did more of that aggressiveness because mm. sometimes the persistence is what gets you in the door. It's not your talent sometimes, believe it or not. Talent right. is just, uh, uh, being persistent because there's very talented people that never get the opportunity because they're not persistent. Mm-hmm. And the person that has the opportunity is not as, as, as talented as that person that didn't take that chance. And and I wish I would have known more of that. I don't, don't when I did those things, it was almost almost like uh, like an animal's instinct. It was survival mode I was in. And but if I what I know now about being persistent and uh, aggressive, if I could have uh, added that on back then, it wouldn't have been nothing to stop me. I mean, cause, because I wouldn't have said, you know, I wouldn't have been scared when they say no. I'd have been like, huh? What do you mean no? And I would have figured out another way. And now I have that spirit, you know, but then I didn't, I didn't have it at all. Was, you know, but that, that incident, there was more on an instant, instinctual thing that I did. I, I, the Cosby show was something I grew up on. So, and I had an opportunity not to be part of it. You go and you tell me, right. no, <laughs> right. now, you know, so it became yeah. you know, like a, a, a woman with her cubs or something, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, you, know you, you get that instinctual, like, oh, survival mode. Yeah. Um, and I think that's important because, even today, with what's going on in in our society, there's a lot of no's going on. Even now, even with me, but it's to me, I laugh about it because I it's, there's no door I can't get into because I I know I know who I am, and once you know who you are as an individual, I'm educated now. I got the I, got, I have the credentials, I have uh, the, the the background of films now. Uh, literally, it's kind of odd when somebody says no to me. I, you know, it's like, what, what do you mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, it, I think it, it has to do with knowing who you are. If Once you know who you are, then doors are automatically open up for you. Well, if you walk in the door and you say, I'm Allison, and you say it in a certain way, a person will say, Allison, what is she saying? Something about that name is going to trigger because not the name itself is the way you present yourself as the name. Mm-hmm. I walk in the door, I'm Mark Casey. I'm somebody important. So how do you expect me to think that you're important, Allison, if you don't think you're important? Mm-hmm. So yeah. once you once you realize how important you are, then others will too. And I'm not saying being egotistic or pride. Some of those things can help though. However, I'm saying know who you are and everyone else will see and doors will open. And some people will see and be intimidated, but some will see it and, and, and gladly let you walk on the red carpet or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like in your path, you had a few, a few hurdles to get over to be able to get to that. Like, like I'm sure most everybody does, but I don't know that everybody gets to the point where they realize that, well, even, even, you know. even, even right now, after this this run with the Nikita Blues, <clears throat> that was a big thing for me, Nikita Blues. Mm-hmm. Once it happened, I said, oh, I'm in now. And so I started getting calls. So 20th Century Fox called me and they said, we have a show, we have this movie called Barbershop. And I said, um, Barbershop? And I'm thinking it was a, it was from, a, back then it was a play, a Chitlin play called Beauty Shop. And I didn't know the difference. So I'm thinking this is ghetto film. And I didn't want to be associated with anything black and ghetto at that time, because at that point I made the key to blues. So now I have a, a, arrived and I'm thinking I'm John Singleton, Spike Lee now. So I, I don't even go to the meeting with 20th Century Fox, how foolish that was. Hmm. So they called me and said, hey, you didn't you didn't come to the meeting. I said, I'm busy because I didn't want to do Chitlin ghetto movie and have my name attached to it. And so they said, well, can you at least send us a videotape of your work or something? Uh, whatever I called my sister. Hey, just send him something. I mean, what, it was no fancy tape. It was probably a, a scene or two of, of Nikita Blues or something, or a trailer. I didn't put no effort to it because I didn't want the job. And then when the job happened, a guy that I went to USC with got the job. Actually, he went before me. I came in after him, named Tim Story. Tim Story 
got the job in barbershop. And when I saw it, I said, oh, barbershop, not beauty shop. So I turned down the wrong damn movie. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but Tim Story had the same mindset that I have because he would not come back and do barbershop one, two, I mean, two, three, two or three. And he wound up doing the Fantastic Four and Taxi with Queen Latifah, all these big white movies because he did that one Black Ghetto movie. And if I'd have done that, I'd have had that same trajectory mm. for my career. But by me being arrogant and cocky, I said no. But I thought it, I literally didn't think it was a barbershop that we saw with Ice Cube. I thought it was something worse. But I will say this, Allison, I would have been fired anyway because they disrespected uh, Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King, uh, a subject the entertainer, uh, talk, uh, degraded my black uh, leaders. And I, and I was blessed to meet Rosa Parks because she died in Detroit. She lived in, in Detroit. Oh. And Rosa Parks was a hero to me and definitely Martin Luther King. So they, I would have been fired anyway because I would not have had allowed uh, Cedric the Entertainer to talk that negative talk he did against those two people. And they would have said, hey, Mark, it's just a joke. And I'm like, no, it's not a joke. Mm. He cannot say that. So it wasn't meant for me anyway. So sometimes God allow you to miss out on something because Guess what? I'd rather had not taken that job and taking that job and been blackballed. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. oh, they, oh, he's hard to work with. Oh, you know, they, so they never could say those things about me because I didn't take that that journey. Right. <laughs> I would have had barbershop. That would have been me, Mark Casey. Uh, I'm interested in your meeting with Rosa Parks. Oh, uh, yeah. I met um, uh, Miss Parks at the school. Uh, I, back, you know, back then, uh, after I did Nikita Blues, I started searching for more investment money because I, I realized, oh, I can just do my stuff independent. And since I don't have a grandma with uh, a credit card, I can find someone else that has the credit card. So I literally started going around the country and trying to get money uh, for my next p- feature film. I went back home. I said, well, let me start home and hit the churches. Uh, and I have a little success from home because they knew they saw Nikita Blues. And back then, to make a movie was huge. Now you can make a movie on your iPhone, so it's not as big of a deal. And we, we didn't have uh, Amazon, Netflix, Google Play, and iTunes and all right. this other stuff. Any movie you made was going to be on something mainstream, you know? <laughs> so uh, 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 it was a big deal. Uh, so I went back home to look for more money. And this guy who was a principal of a school he created called the Malcolm X Academy, I figured, well, if he has a school like that, he has contacts for money because he has foundations and things like that. So I was introduced to him and uh, Miss Parks came to meet the students and I happened to be there. And the sad part about it is I gave her a hug and I wanted a picture. And her niece said, no pictures because the flash affects her eyes. Now, we didn't have iPhones then with no flash. So I'm like, right. oh, no, I need a picture with Rosa. Nobody's going to believe. So I never got the picture with Rosa Parks, Miss Parks, because the flash hurts her eyes. Because back then we had flash. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. And portable cameras. So yeah, that was yeah. my meeting with her. Mm. And also her lawyer was also trying to help me get money at the time, too. I was really connected in Detroit at that time because I did this movie, Nikita Blues. And I, I brought some kids out of uh, Detroit to Los Angeles. And one of them became a big star. Brandon T. Jackson uh, played in um, Tropic Thunder with Ben Stiller, uh, Roll Bounce with Bow Wow, and that fantasy movie, uh, Percy Jackson. I don't know if you heard of it. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. his, name, his name is Brandon T. Jackson. He played in Percy Jackson as the guy who had the legs as a... Uh, as a goat legs, uh, 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 in that, but I put him, I was, I put him in his first feature film, wow. uh, which was, uh, he came, I brought him from Detroit to Los Angeles and he wound up making a million dollars a, a movie after working with Nikita Blues. He did Roll Bounce, Tropic Thunder and all those Percy Jackson movies. So he was highly blessed, uh, because of my connection. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I like to take that credit. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so that's how I met Miss Parks and I wind up taking a job because, I got some bad advice in film school, and I'm I'm going to say his name because I'm mad because I used to didn't say his name, but I'm, he's a friend of mine now, so I'm going to say his name. His <laughs> name is Reginald Hutland, and uh, he's done a lot of movies. He's he's doing them now. Did Boomerang with Eddie Murphy, and he's a multimillionaire. So, but my comments won't hurt him. But Mr. Hutland came to my uh, film school class and told us. And remember, this is a big time black director and I'm just in film school and Reginald Hutland came. He just got to do a boomerang with Eddie Murphy. So he was like God to everybody. 
He says, don't take an internship for none of these studios because you would be considered a slave. Now, oh, by the way, I didn't, let me preface this. This was a black cinema class that this guy named Todd Boyd created because mm-hmm. uh, he was the first black professor at the film school. And his name is Todd Boyd. He's on everything, every every commentary they have him commentate on any of the documentaries you see. This big black guy named Dr. Todd Boyd. He was my teacher. So he created these classes for black cinema. He, get, he convinced USC to okay it. So this class, I was in one of his first black cinema classes, so he invited a black director. Reginald Hunton comes in and gives us all the stories about Hollywood, and we all in eye. And he says, oh, and by the way, don't take any internships with none of these studios because you'll be considered a slave and you're working for free. You won't get paid, and they're just using you, da-da-da-da-da. Now, mind you, he went to Princeton or something like that, or Harvard, Princeton. So that means he came from money. And so I took that stupid advice because I don't know if you know about University of Southern California. USC film school, but it's connected to Hollywood. And that means you literally can call any ABC, Fox, Netflix, and get an internship by proving that you're a film student. Mm. Automatic. Ain't <laughs> no applications or nothing. They just, oh, you go to film school at USC? The door's wide open. Mm-hmm. I get an internship at Warner Brothers. I tell them no, because of this guy. Uh-huh. Brother of television, I get I turn down the internship. Fast forward, I graduate, Get I have no job now. And because I didn't do what? Take yeah. the internship. Every intern that took the intern that ignored Mr. Hutland worked as executive. Even to this day, I have executive friends that make three, four hundred thousand a year because they started off as an intern, something that I was too arrogant and cocky listening to someone else that was in a position to be arrogant and cocky, but I wasn't. So mm-hmm. I went back to Detroit, got a job at Circuit City, believe it or not, a normal life. Hmm. As a manager, they gave me a manager job because I had a degree, but it was the worst experience I had because I was this black man in this white city, a suburb of Detroit, and all my employees was white and they couldn't stand me because I was the boss. And Michigan was not known for having black managers, even to this day. Uh, if you go to any CVS, Rite Aid, uh, whatever, Walgreens, and you say, let me speak to the manager, it's going to be a little white kid come out or, or a white lady come out. And you're going to hmm. say, wait a minute. I thought I was in the hood. It doesn't matter. It's just uh-huh. that's culture. But so I was the exception to the rule. So, I, you know, so they were calling late. I had to write up people every day. And it got to the point, this older white gentleman, which was in law enforcement, he was a Detroit police too. So we already bonded. He pulled me to the side and said, hey, Mark, I'm going to be straight with you. I said, what? He said, you having so much trouble is because you're black. And they're not used to seeing a black man with the power that you have. You're talking to them any kind of way. They're not used to that. You're writing them up. You're sending them home. They're not used to that. They, they used to being on the other side talking to, to you that way and sending mm-hmm. you home. So don't get offended if, you, if you're not being be successful. I say, I, won't, I, I, I totally got that the first six months. So one day I go to lunch. I go to the mall to buy me a new tie because you had to wear suits. And I look up on a TV screen. I see the Moesha show. And, I'm, and I see Brandy and some people that I know from Hollywood. And I said, what the hell am I doing here in Michigan? I didn't come back for lunch. Mm, yeah. Get on the first thing smoking back to L.A., baby. Nice. I said, hey, called one of my college roommate uh, friends that was graduating. Because everybody graduated at that point. And she working for Quincy Jones, by the way, because she was a what? An uh, intern. <laughs> and she got hired in by mm. Quincy Jones. And so I said, hey, can I sleep on your couch? Sure. Drove all the way from Detroit. He slept on her couch and uh, she let me stay there. Uh, another college friend of mine called me and said, hey, I said, hey, man, what's going on? He was a year behind me. I said, well, hey, what's, what's going on? He says, I'm actually interning for um, Orion Pictures at MGM. Now, at this point, I'm saying, can I be an intern? He said, yeah. <laughs> he said, but they don't pay. They're not paying any money. I don't care. I just want to be. So I literally go and interview become an intern at Orion Pictures, which was associated with MGM at the time, and in a company called Motion Picture Corporation of America. They did the movie Dumb and Dumber. They did the movie Something About Mary, Eight Heads in a Duffel Bag. Now, all the, these are all white comedies that made over $100 million. So I'm in a white company now, but it's a small enclave of black people that they hired in because Denzel went in there and said, I want a production company. And they gave him a little production company that he never came to, but he was hooking up one of his boys. So I actually would work through this black company that was inside of this, this white corporation. Mm-hmm. So I was there every day so much that the guy who gave me the opportunity, he wound up quitting 
Uh, he says, man, I need a job to make some money. I'm like, dude, I'm good. I'm going to figure out how to make some money, but I want this internship because I figured out how to get in. So he quit. So now it's just me in here and I'm I'm working the whole five floors, you know, of everywhere, studio. It's, it's awesome. And everybody's looking at me like, wow, this, who's this kid? And I'm like, I went to SC. So I stopped telling folks I went to SC because they, it started offending the, the white kids that couldn't get in. So mm-hmm. I, I started saying I went to San Monica College. And they accepted me then, and, you know, because hmm. I had to, I, it's kind of weird because yeah. I, I was more educated than them because they couldn't get right. an SC. They was going to uh, Hofstra, uh, you know, all these, you know, little schools that's in New York and all over. I was blessed to go to USC. So hmm. I befriended one of the assistants at the time. She went to Harvard. And I'm like, how you are you an assistant and you went to Harvard? She says, she says Mark, I made 55000 a year and drive a BMW. Yeah. I'm like. Oh, you make fifty five thousand back then. Fifty five thousand was a lot of money, yeah. And a BMW. So she she says, since you're here all the time bugging me, can you help me with these scripts? I said, what do you want me to do? Said, here, read them and give me back the analysis. I said, well, how do you do analysis? I'm here. I'm gonna give you the format. Doom. So I learned how to do the analysis. So I did what they call script analysis, which at the time they were paying outside workers fifty dollars a script. Okay, mm-hmm. I was doing scripts for free. Ha. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And the other people would come in and get five scripts and they get $50 a script. And, you know, that's $200, $300. I would get zero. Mm. Didn't bother me. So this, this young blonde Harvard graduate was wanted to be a producer and she knew how to play the game. And she said, I'm going to be an assistant and I'm going to trust me. I'm going to be rolling eventually, but I need your help because I got too much work. So the blacks that I was working under got a, got a little bit testy, like, hey, you're doing too much around the office around. Here. I said, well, I'm sorry, what you mean? We, you were here before we here, and you're here after we leave. And I even heard you here on the weekends, Allison, because you know why? I didn't have a place to stay. The girl kicked me out of her bed, so I started uh, sleeping at the office. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> so that's how bad do you want it? I could have went on home, but I had a, I had another house I owned in the suburb of Detroit mm. called Southfield. So I could have went on home, but I said, not this time. Mm-hmm. So I was literally sleeping at the at this the studio. And so the, the organization that hired me within the corporation said, Hey Mark, we see that you, um, he, he said, I, we see that you are an opportunist, which I didn't know what that meant. Uh, right. <laughs> I said, what do you mean I'm an opportunist? He said, we see you are an opportunist. And so we're going to ask you to let you go because we don't need an intern. Oh man. The best thing that could happen to me. Oh yeah. I said, oh, no problem, sir. Have a nice day. I go down to the, the pretty blonde Harvard grad and say, hey, they let me go. So I'm let you go where? Uh, they told me they need an intern. Well, I need an intern. <laughs> so now I'm in-house. Forget the little black organization. I'm in-house. They gave me an office downstairs with the Farley brothers who did all those movies. Just look up the Farley brothers. The yeah, right. brothers and, and some about Mary. I was there when they was creating something about Mary. They were trying to figure out Carmen Diaz or this person. Mm-hmm. And then asked me, and I'm like, Carmen Diaz is good. You know, so I was literally there while they were creating uh, something about Mary with Ben Stiller. So I, now I have, we share an office downstairs. And now the black organization, one of the members come down and say, hey, we told you you can't be in this building. I said, I don't work for you. <laughs> I work for them now. Mm. And they left me alone. Hmm. Fast forward. They put me on the second floor. Now I have the whole floor to myself. But I have no money to hire assistants and producers to work. So it's me and a white gentleman up there sharing this big old office space. He said, why don't you call an internship company that they will send you some interns? I did. So I had a whole floor of young kids, receptionists, <laughs> script readers. Every, so you, when you came on the second floor, you, I was cooking. Mm. So I started having auditions for my movie. And because I had a Nigerian investor say, I'm going to invest in your film. So I told studio, I got seed money. If, and they said, we got you. If you got seed money to start, we're going to distribute it for you. So now I got the second floor off the chain. It's, it's, it's bumping. And Will Smith auntie comes in for an audition for her son because I, I needed the kid in my movie. And she said, uh, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm Will Smith, uh, Jada Pickett's aunt. I said, so why are you here? She said, because I can't go to them. I'd rather get my own son and start. Hmm. I said, you... Jada Pickett, and so I made some call finals. She was Jada Pickett's auntie. And somehow she said, she, we communicated, and then she realized I was living there. She said, you live at the office, don't you? I said, well, you asked me that. Mark, I got a big old place. You can come stay with me. 
Jada pick is up. Wow. So J- Jada pick is up. I go stay with Jada pick is up. Come out of the office. Now I'm living in her big old, she had a big old place, like a duplex. And MC Light is, is living there off and on too, who was working with Janet Jackson at the time. They was doing the album, a Joni Mitchell album she did when she redid Joni Mitchell's song. Mm. So I'm saying, Janet Jackson, I'm, oh, I'm about to meet Janet. So now I'm in a mix of this, another scenario, but now I'm going to work from her house instead of sleeping in the office. Mm-hmm. And she says, Mark, we have a lot of female stuff here. And I prefer if you go out sometimes because you stay here too much and we like to do our girl thing. So I, I call one of my buddies. He's going to be your driver since you don't have a car and he's going to drive you anywhere you go. So she called a friend of hers in the music industry named Luce Gordon. So he started to be pick me up in the morning, take me to the office, take pick me up from the office. And then he said one day, he says, hey, listen, I got a meeting at uh, Warner Brothers, this group called Naughty by Nature I'm managing. And I knew who Naughty by Nature was. And they got a meeting with uh, at Warner Brothers, the record label. Would you like to come? I said, what? Yeah, well, I don't have nothing else to do. So she said, Mark, you can drive my BMW today. Because he wound up calling me saying, I'm not going to be able to pick you up because the guys want me to pick him up at the airport. So I tell her, I say, Laverne, let me get the, be- the Beamer. She had a brand new, beautiful Beamer. Perception. I'll take my perception in a minute. And so I take the beautiful black Beamer. And she said, no problem. This what time you be back? I said, this won't be long. So I get to Warner Brothers in the Beamer. I get to the meeting. I'm in the lobby. And uh, the executive says, oh, who are you here? I said, well, I'm here with uh, Luce with Naughty Band. Oh, yeah, they all in here. So she literally brings me inside of the meeting now. So mm-hmm. I'm in the back because I don't want to be infringing. And they're they talking about, you know, a million dollars this. And, and no, my artists need to have this because they had Eric Benet there and all this other. And then the lady stops and says, hey, what do you do? I said, uh, I'm a filmmaker. I'm a director. I make movies. You got some scripts? Because I got artists that need to be in movies. I said, yeah. She said, well, you know, I got this concept for a video, but to let the video back then, they was doing million dollar videos back then. Mm-hmm. You go, I want to have some vignettes of all my artists and you make a movie. She said, can you send me your work so I can know what you got? Allison, nah, I'm trying to be nice. This is not my meeting. I didn't say, <laughs> hey, how you doing? My name is Mark Casey. Mm-hmm. He singled me out and I said, sure. She gave me her card. She said, I'll be expecting that uh, script today. So the meeting ended. Anyway, she went out. They went out. They hugged. They did their million dollar deal or whatever. I go and she comes outside to see what I'm driving. I know. Uh-huh. She uses as an excuse. She's smoking. And she saw me drive up. I, I stopped at the light and she said, Hey. And I said, Hey. She saw that beautiful BMW. So in her eyes, I was already <laughs> successful. Yeah. So perception is everything. So I sent her the script. She sends me a contract back, Allison, within 24 hours for $250,000. Now remember, I'm sleeping on the floor at the office. Right. Wow. So I get a contract for $250,000 and it comes through the company's fax. So not everybody in the studio know Mark Casey got a deal with Warner Brothers. Oh my God. (laughs) <laughs> so the CEO, the president of the company, Brad Cavoy and Steve Stabler, they say, we got to have a meeting because the black people heard about it and said, hey, Steve, hey, Brad, Mark got a deal off your name. He used your company, Orion Pictures, to get his deal because that's what you do. You, you can you mm. can work deals when you have you know, a major production. I said, no, I did not. Mm. I used my own company. It was called Foremost Entertainment. And I had it. And so when she sent the contract, the final contract she sent said Foremost Entertainment. Never said anything about MPCA or Orion or MGM or whatever. Mm-hmm. It said Mark Casey, Foremost Entertainment. So when the CEO got it, he said, I'm going to tell you now, Mark, that $250,000, we're getting a portion of it. I said, what you mean? He says, because you used our name. I said, sir, I did not use your name. And if I did, then you should get a portion of it. You correct. He, he said, I need, it. I need the documents sent to my lawyer. So I sent the documents to his lawyer. The lawyer read it, came back. He says, Mark, congratulations. You are now a real producer. You don't need our office. You got money to get your own office. Have a nice day. Mm-hmm. Thank you, sir. <laughs> they didn't take a nickel from me. I went over to Avenue of the Stars, got my own thing cooking. And that's how I began Foremost Entertainment. Wow. <laughs> and here you are. That's amazing. Wow. Yeah, being in the right place at the right time, but also doing that work around it. I mean, it's a combination. Yeah, that's amazing. When, about when was, how long ago was that? 
oh, at least 15, 20 years now. Yeah. Awesome. I've been cooking I mean, medicine. yeah, with fasting <laughs> and all that. <laughs> wow. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. What a great story. Yeah. You've mentioned a few a few movies and things that have been inspiration, but what what or who would you say has been a big inspiration for you, either growing up or throughout your career? I'll be honest, my catalyst was John Singleton. It's just something about mm-hmm. they made him a star overnight, and it was something about that that I was attracted to. I was like, yeah, he was a young kid. We were the same age, and, and, you know, it was just something about his journey was special to me. And like I said, Spike Lee had a, was older than me. Spike Lee is old, a lot older than me, so his journey was different. This other kid went through the school system, and that's what I did. So mm-hmm. John was more, one of my most influential people. In uh, if we, I don't think if, if it wasn't for John Singleton, I wouldn't think I don't, I don't think it, I would have thought it was possible mm-hmm. to do this, mm-hmm. you know, on that level. And so, yeah, yeah, I would say uh, John Singleton is. Yeah. yeah. What are your thoughts around? Because you were mentioning there were only a couple, like less than a handful of of shows that were full of a um, black cast in mm-hmm. in the times when you were acting. What 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 are your thoughts for how it is now versus then? Or do you feel it's like night it's and a, day, baby? It's night yeah. and day. It's, it's it's more shows now than it look like it's more shows than networks. It's a, so I, everything I do it has it has a subliminal message. Uh, that's educating. Sasha Lane's coming out, Black Skin coming out, Last Chance to Dance, I just finished last weekend. And currently I have a movie that's on iTunes and uh, Apple and Amazon uh, and Google Play called Flint Tale about the water crisis, uh, which was another issue because you're dealing with blacks, but everybody got sick. It wasn't just black folks. It's just uh, right. Flint has a large population of black folks, but a lot of whites got sick too. Let me keep that clear. And, and, and white babies as well got lead poisoning. And uh, I dedicated the movie uh, to a young lady by the name of Jasmine McBride who died from drinking the water in Flint. Hmm. And so the movie is currently out called Flint Tale, T-A-L-E. And the first word is called Flint. And you can Google that and watch that movie and support it. Because like I said, I dedicated to move the movie to a woman that actually was drinking that water thinking it was okay. Mm-hmm. And I shot it in Flint. Uh, I went up to Flint and he hired some of the Flint people. And then I brought the Hollywood stars to Flint. So my movies now are about educating, uh, getting you to think I'm not in the comedies is cool because we all need to laugh, but that's just not my calling. I'm, yeah. I'm more yeah. of a dramatic, dramatic drama person. I want, I want to hit you where you can think uh, on, and then I throw in different messages in my films. So you kind of figure out like, wow, I didn't know that because of what, what I saw, what changed my life uh, when I saw TV shows or movies. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for sharing that, that your insight on, on that. I appreciate that. Anything else that we missed? Anything else you want to highlight? Yes. We we can't we gotta stop ignoring these babies getting killed, getting shot, and mm-hmm. that's important. And most of them are black kids getting killed. We gotta mm-hmm. we, we gotta we gotta speak up about this media that I'm in, this programming from the music, programming from the television shows and programming from the movies. I'm not trying to censor, censor anything. I'm just trying to give awareness. Right. I think it's important. Absolutely. I, I appreciate your time and I appreciate you hanging with me and sharing your thoughts. And yeah, I look forward to, to watching Flint Tale and, and some of your other work. I appreciate Please do. Sharing that. Yeah. Thank you so much for being part of uh, Take Notice and for hanging out with me this morning. Thank you for joining us for Take Notice Amplifying Black Stories. Please subscribe and follow us on social media. We are at Take Notice Podcast. It would really help us out if you could take a couple of minutes to review our podcast. You can do so through your podcast app or by visiting our website. It's takenoticepodcast.org. Thank you for your support. Take Notice Amplifying Black Stories is produced, hosted, and edited by Allison Preisinger Higgins with help from many. Music by Version Big Five featuring Darius Higgins. Thank you for being with us, and thank you for taking notice.